This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. And thank you to everyone who may be listening now or who may listen to this uh, later on uh, in its recorded form. Uh, I am Mike Madison. I am a law professor. I teach at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm actually coming to you today from Philadelphia, where I am in a, in a Knowledge Commons conference. Uh, I am by my sometimes say my day job, my primary research area before getting involved in commons research is intellectual property law and copyright law in particular. So my interest in commons governance and sharing in institutional settings comes out of my history studying and writing about um, exclusive rights for uh, intellectual resources. Uh, and related things. So at that point, I'm going to hit my share screen button and pull up a short slide deck. And that should work there. Okay. Oops. Looks good, Perfect. Mike. Yep. Okay. Yep. We're working, excellent. Okay, so uh, here's my title, Governing Knowledge Commons, A Short History uh, and Update. So um, there is now, I think it's fair to say, an emerging field of research that we call generally knowledge commons, and I'll talk about what that is, but primarily this presentation is going to be about that aspect of knowledge commons research that I have primarily been involved with, helping to start the field and advance the field over the last 12 or 13 years. So uh, as we'll see, there are slightly different uh, variations or flavors of knowledge commons out there in the research world at this point. So what you're going to hear for the next 30 minutes is sort of a story and summary of uh, what we like to think is one very dominant thread in that story, but it is not intended to be exhaustive of all things. Um, so uh, first, a brief definition, particularly for people who are coming to a knowledge commons conversation from other histories or versions of commons research. Uh, we need a little bit of a working definition of knowledge as well as how we describe commons for our purposes. So commons is the, is the easier one to approach in terms of the history of commons research. Uh, we describe commons as governance and it's governance of shared resources. Uh, so the idea of commons research for us is describing and understanding the mechanisms and techniques and rules and norms associated with a shared resource of some sort. So that typically involves some sort of community or collective or group. Uh, it means identifying one or more resources that is subject to commons governance. And it typically entails commons governance as a governance strategy that is intended or that is developed to respond to and solve one or more dilemmas associated with producing that resource, managing that resource, distributing that resource, accessing that resource, or some combination of the other. Uh, we do not use the word commons, as some people sometimes do, to refer to, to refer to a place. We do not refer to commons as a thing. So we, we try to avoid saying a commons or the commons. We try to refer just to commons because we're trying to direct people to the idea of commons as governance. And what we're trying to do is to understand governance. Relatedly, we have to have a working definition of knowledge. So what do we mean by knowledge? What's included in that phrase? So there we try to be very, very broad and very, very inclusive. When we started this project a dozen years ago, all uh, those of us who have been researching in this area largely came from an intellectual property law background. So we were thinking about inventions and copyright works and data collections and trade secrets. But we're very inclusive of other sorts of intangible resources that may or may not have specific intellectual property law 
attributes. So the idea is that these are intellectual, cultural, technical uh, products and resources. They may be individualized at some, at some level, the way that inventions are the subject of patents. But then we want to turn that question around relative to patents and say, how might patents in a particular field be shared or pooled? Um, so knowledge commons is intended to capture a very, very broad domain of intellectual, creative, cultural resources that may come out of legal processes. So things like patents and copyrights and trademarks are largely defined by legal processes in, in the first place, or the knowledge resources may come out of other sorts of cultural backgrounds or dynamics. So it may be the case that data or ideas or other cultural expressions or cultural works are the subject of commons governance, but do not necessarily relate to strongly embedded legal systems that define those things to begin with. The last thing to note in connection with the definition of the scope is that from an intellectual property standpoint, the, the primary dilemma that we intuit uh, to be present in commons domains is not the classic tragedy of the commons overconsumption dilemma. Rather, in the, in the knowledge context, the starting point is very often the inverse. The starting point is very often an underproduction dilemma. That is, free writing relative to a resource leads to uh, a lack of incentive to invest in producing the resource to begin with because the producers cannot uh, capture uh, rents associated with use of the resource. So it's a starting point. The underproduction dilemma or the free riding dilemma is a starting point rather than an end point. So there are clearly dilemmas and problems associated with knowledge resources that are not captured by an underproduction story. But that underproduction story is the intuition that animated the, the initial investment in knowledge commons research. So let me shift forward briefly to the group of us who really um, uh, would, does, not, does not exhaust the universe of people who have been working in Knowledge Commons, but this is the group that really got things started and have been in the leadership end of the what we call the workshop on governing Knowledge Commons that you see the, the website URL in the lower left corner. So I'm in the top center just because of the alphabetical character of, uh, of the top line. Uh, I'm at the University of Pittsburgh in law. My colleagues, Brett Frischman, now at Villanova University at the law school, and Kathy Strandberg at New York University at the law school there. The three of us started this collaboration around Knowledge Commons back in 2004, 2005. So the three of us have been working very closely and very deliberately on this, this problem for a long time. Charlie Schweik uh, at UMass uh, got involved very early on. We had the very first workshop around Knowledge Commons at NYU back in 2011. And Charlie was working then on a very, very important book uh, applying the, uh, the work of the Ostrom Workshop to open source software development. Uh, Madeline Sanfilippo in the bottom center is a, a postdoc, a recent graduate of uh, Indiana University trained in informatics. Uh, she's currently at Princeton University and recently got very involved in this project by doing a postdoc also at NYU with Kathy Strandberg. And then Tom Dudubadera at uh, uh, Louvain La Neuve in Belgium, uh, who has done some very important work uh, on knowledge sharing uh, with Jerry Reichman at Duke. Uh, Tom also hosted the first IASC uh, Knowledge Commons convening at Louvain La Neuve back in 2012. Um, so what's interesting about this cluster of people uh, is that the, the three of us who got it started back in 2005, 2006, did come from law, but we've been very, uh, very deliberate about uh, including disciplinary traditions, disciplinary pathways from other fields. So public policy, informatics, political science, economics, uh, philosophy, and so forth. So the idea behind knowledge commons research, like all commons research, is that it should be accessible to people who have 
multiple types of training and the insights from different traditions can be can be blended effectively. So to this point, uh, since 2005, 2006, uh, these are the, the significant works that this group of people uh, has produced. Uh, on the top left is a, a journal issue of the Cornell Law Review published in 2010, where the three of us, Brett Frischman, Kathy Strandberg, and myself, uh, published what we now call the Knowledge Commons Research Framework very much inspired by the work of Eleanor Ostrom, very much borrowing many of the stylistic uh, goals and strategies uh, of Eleanor Ostrom and her work, but trying to refine and re-describe Commons research, taking into account many of the different attributes and dilemmas associated with knowledge production, distribution, and consumption in contrast to the problems associated with natural resource uh, access and uh, consumption. Uh, Charlie Schweik's book, Internet Success, uh, and then the, the two volumes of collected knowledge commons case studies, not governing knowledge commons published uh, in 2011, excuse me, uh, governing knowledge commons published in 2014, at Oxford University Press and Governing Medical Knowledge Commons published in 2017 at uh, Cambridge University Press. Those two books are both collections of qualitative case studies of knowledge commons governance. The first book, Governing Knowledge Commons, is by design very eclectic and diverse in its subject matter. So it includes a contribution from Charlie Schweik on open source software development. There are also chapters describing uh, medical research, a chapter on astrophysics research, uh, a chapter on journalism, particularly journalism in an older era with a historical theme, a chapter describing uh, sharing of uh, military technology in the Canadian military, another blend of uh, technology-based uh, commons and historical commons governance, uh, a chapter describing the early development of powered flight, uh, aircraft design and development in France in the late 19th century. Uh, and uh, on the cultural side, in addition to the chapter on uh, journalism, there's also a chapter on uh, the American phenomenon known as roller derby, uh, which is a very uh, interesting uh, American um, sort of uh, hobby and practice where there's a lot of uh, information and sharing of cultural resources. So the idea behind knowledge, governing knowledge commons, the first book in 2014, was to gather a lot of case studies from a lot of different technical fields, scientific fields, cultural fields, and historical as examples, as well as contemporary examples, uh, in order to demonstrate the broad potential utility of the knowledge commons concept and the broad potential utility of the knowledge commons research, research framework as a tool for investigating the mechanics of knowledge commons governance in those settings. The more recent book, 2017, Governing Medical Knowledge Commons, the same overall project design, meaning qualitative case studies applying the governing knowledge commons framework, but this time doing a deeper dive into a more focused subject area. So all of the commons case studies in the governing medical knowledge commons book have something to do with clinical medical practice, medical research, or public health research. Again, much of it in the US, but also some examples drawn from uh, the Canada and from uh, Europe. Uh, as well. And in that book, as in the first book, we've got authors or scholars who are drawn from law, some from public policy, some from economics, um, some from history, some from, uh, and we've also had some contributions from people who uh, work otherwise in environmental resource management. So the, the research community in each of these books is uh, very broad 
and diverse. This slide I have listed in eight points the, the key takeaways, the key lessons that we have learned so far, aggregating the implications of all of the cases that we have collected in these works uh, to date. Um, the key bullet point takeaways in many respects will overlap with lessons learned from Lynn Ostrom's research and the research associated with the Ostrom workshop, but in some key respects, they're different. And in the yellow bold type on the slides, I've highlighted really the key takeaways. Uh, one, that the social dilemmas or barriers to effective collaborative governance in these situations are often quite diverse and there are often multiple dilemmas or multiple barriers that need to be identified, described, and overcome in practice so that commons governance in the knowledge commons context does not reduce to simply overcoming a free writing problem. Uh, we have multiple dilemmas often in each of these knowledge settings. Uh, nesting or uh, polycentricity of uh, shared governance mechanisms is very, very typical. Uh, sometimes these are multiple commons systems aligned in parallel with one another or overlapping with one another. In some respects, we see hierarchical relationships between commons governance that is layered on top of shared infrastructure resources at one or two layers down. Uh, next, the idea of informal governance, social norms, trust relationships, uh, uh, trusted leadership in particular, seems to be a very, very important theme that transcends uh, particular cases. So as lawyers, we went into this research expecting to understand a lot of formal rule sets and uh, to understand the significance of legal rules or the significance of the absence of legal rules, uh, it was something of a surprise to us to be seeing the importance in repeated settings of informal governance, trust, social norms, and informal leadership mechanisms. Uh, the idea that commons evolve over time and understanding pathways of evolution of commons governance is a very important theme that we have seen repeatedly. We have been struck by the diversity of motivations to participate in and to contribute to commons governance that we've observed in multiple case studies. The, uh, there is at times in uh, governance literature uh, some assumptions about uh, selfish motivations by individuals or uh, sort of other regarding or generous, uh, you know, uh, predispositions to to share uh, for virtuous reasons. Uh, and what we find in practice is that in any given governance environment, in any given governance case, we see a diversity of motivations at the individual level. This is where informal systems of trust, informal systems of leadership, informal systems of norms are often very, very important in aggregating and helping individuals with diverse motivations uh, collaborate effectively to manage the resource. Um, and the last thing I think it's very important uh, in the knowledge commons context is to note the importance of the state uh, in many, although of course not all, knowledge commons contexts. Uh, the state plays many possible roles in knowledge commons context. The most important one right off the bat is for knowledge commons environments that do depend on intellectual property resources such as patents or copyrights, uh, and uh, we see commons governance uh, used to combine or collect those patents or copyrights in complicated ways. The state is present at the first place simply as the agent that defines the scope of the resource to begin with. Copyrights are defined by the state, patents are defined by the state, and that's a very important moment in the evolution of a commons governance regime. So what's going on right now? What brings us up to the present time? There are two books 
that our Knowledge Commons Collective is uh, starting to prepare. One is a book currently titled Privacy as Knowledge Commons Governance. So Madeline Sanfilippo, Brett Frischman, and Kathy Strandberg are editing another collection of qualitative case studies that focus on uh, concepts of privacy, confidentiality, and security uh, as resources that are created and managed by collective activity, exactly as commons governance would expect. Uh, so that's a very exciting project. It's very timely in light of global conversations today around privacy interests, around cybersecurity and related things. There's a second book that's in production, uh, also under the auspices of our Governing Knowledge Commons Collective called Governing Markets as Knowledge Commons, the New Entrepreneurial History of Shared Social Infrastructures. The idea behind that book is that there are important Knowledge Commons resources in markets that are nonetheless governed as commons. So this reinforces the idea that commons is a set of governance strategies rather than uh, something that is inherent to uh, firms or markets or inherent to things that are outside firms or markets. Commons and markets can coexist in complicated ways. I want to emphasize that all of this work on knowledge commons to date is very heavily uh, invested in and we emphasize very heavily that we're trying to pursue research rather than policy prescription or preparation of anything analogous to Eleanor Ostrom's design principles from governing the commons. Uh, what, we, what we knew from the beginning as intellectual property researchers is that the world of intellectual property law is very weak when it comes to effective empirical understanding of governance institutions, that there is not much out there in the literature in the way of comparative institutional analysis of governance mechanisms that includes shared governance mechanisms like commons. So what we are trying to do is very explicitly to create a pool of case studies that will help us refine the research framework ultimately generate hypothesis based on the quantity of data that we can collect and then use that data to generate further research of an experimental nat nature, of a quantitative nature, eventually to produce theories, eventually to produce models, and ideally eventually to produce design principles that practitioners and policymakers could use um, in practice. Let me close with some quick notes on how our work on Knowledge Commons relates to the Ostrom Workshop and how it relates to other commentary, scholarship, and thinking about commons in the cultural or knowledge environment. First, as law professors, we are well aware that there have been other, there's other work out there prior to ours that talks about the importance of shared resources and knowledge sharing and commons concepts, including Lawrence Lessig, Yochai Benkler, and even a couple of works, of an important book, uh, and uh, some material within the book produced by Lynn Ostrom and Charlotte Hess. Uh, so we are both building on that work, but also trying to set out an agenda for commons research that's quite systematic and thoughtful uh, as a way to refine uh, understanding of knowledge commons in the world. Second, uh, we typically do not look at knowledge commons as a single domain. Rather, we think of knowledge commons as an opportunity for many, many separate related investigations about commons governance in particular institutional settings. Uh, third, we, it's very important that knowledge in all of these settings be understood not as a given phenomenon. Knowledge does not simply exist in the world. Knowledge is something that emerges, something is, knowledge is something that uh, is constructed. It's constructed by social systems. It's constructed by legal systems. Uh, it emerges over time. And so part of researching knowledge commons contexts is the process of understanding the constructed character of the resource 
uh, at, in question. Uh, we prioritize uh, looking for multiple dilemmas and being very sensitive to the possibility that there are many more challenges and obstacles at work in a given knowledge domain than, than simple free writing narratives. Uh, we are attentive to, we're aware of differences in knowledge relative to material resources or natural resources in terms of the character, their economic characteristics. So knowledge is non-depletable and non-excludable as a resource uh, in a way that distinguishes knowledge from the common pool resources that are at the heart of uh, Eleanor Ostrom's program. And we take that into account as we analyze these commons case studies, but we want to blend that understanding of the resource attributes with other understandings of the character of the groups, characters of the rules, characters of the dilemmas, and characters of the solutions. Um, so we are trying to blend our understanding of the economic characteristics of knowledge commons cases and legal or other governance uh, mechanisms associated with those knowledge commons cases. And we are increasingly aware that there are systems of trust and values uh, that play key roles in how some of these knowledge commons op uh, operate. And finally, uh, we want to systematize uh, the overall program once we are comfortable that we have enough data that larger scale generalization and hypothesizing is appropriate. Uh, with that, uh, I will close my presentation, except to note that in the bottom left corner, we do have a website that documents and collects all of the material that I've been talking through in this slide presentation. And everyone watching now and in the future is welcome to come visit us. And uh, we are hoping that we uh, will attract more researchers around the world to this program so that we can continue to grow it. So I will stop it with that and turn the mic back to Charlie in case there are questions. Mike, that, that was a terrific talk. As, as someone who uh, thinks about knowledge commons, um, that was a beautiful summary of uh, what you've been doing, uh, um, the topic and what you've been doing over the past, with your colleagues over the past uh, 12 or more years. Um, so yeah, if there's uh, participants, just a reminder, there's a Q&A window uh, where you can type type questions in. There's a couple uh, in there right now. Um, I'm going to start with the easy one, Mike. Who, who's leading the markets book? Uh, let me go back. Uh, we have, so, so I am not in touch with them myself. So Decker and Kuchar. Uh, and I would be happy to correspond with anyone who is interested after the fact, uh, you know, send out links to their, their website. Um, they are soliciting proposals for an in-person workshop to be held in the Washington DC area in the spring of next year. And I believe that they plan to build the book uh, out of the, the collection of papers that they receive in response to that call. Wonderful. Um, second question. Uh, and, and this is a little deeper. If, if I, so Sylvia says, if I understand this in your governing uh, knowledge commons book, you had an eclectic set of cases. And in your second volume, you focused in the area of medical knowledge commons. Was that focusing helpful? Um, it was helpful in two respects, yes. Um, number one, it was helpful in a very pragmatic sense in that the interest in medical knowledge commons grew out of uh, opportunities that some researchers, particularly Brett Freshman and Kathy Strandberg, uh, some researchers identified medical knowledge commons as part of their contributions to the first book. And having entered the medical research area for the first book, they discovered an enormous opportunity to do continued research in that same area. Uh, because in medical research, they met many, many scientific researchers who are building collaborations around different aspects of medical research, looking for solutions and recommendations and guidance on how to build effective collaborations. And so in pragmatic terms, from the knowledge common standpoint, this looked to us like a great opportunity to, to really uh, dive into a field that is 
increasingly relying on strategies that we would call knowledge commons governance, and that would generate a lot of case study opportunities for us. Um, so that was the very pragmatic sense in which the, the refinement to medicine was useful. It helped energize research uh, based on the, the preliminary investments. The second way in which the refinement was useful was that it, it helped us understand in an in a important way some of the comparative attributes, right? So in, in the first book, when we had uh, you know, military technology innovation and airplane innovation and medical science innovation and uh, astrophysics research as examples of the case studies. Doing case to case comparison and tr trying to identify implications uh, on the basis of those science sorts of comparisons uh, was not easy. There are some obvious challenges in terms of comparing subject matter in such different fields. Uh, by identifying some shared structural elements using the Knowledge Commons framework, we were able to learn a number of things in that first book. But by narrowing the scope to a field that we defined as medical knowledge, uh, the, the case to case comparisons became somewhat more straightforward. So each of the two books has a concluding chapter, and, and this information is available on the website. Each of the two books has a concluding chapter that identifies what we as the editors took away as the key overall implications of the collection of cases overall. And what you see in comparison, comparing the implications from book one to the implications from book two is that in, a, in book two on medical commons, the implications uh, listing and description is m much more um, refined, detailed, uh, and, and I think useful, frankly, uh, going forward uh, than the implications from book one. So I think the overall progression from book one to book two, um, you know, we had a bit of a strategy in starting broad and then trying to go more narrowly. And I think we've been pretty happy in terms of how that's helped us understand the overall research framework and how we have learned to uh, extract preliminary findings from the overall collection. And if I can interject a question for my, my, my own question here, um, as Mike, you've explained really well, but just to make sure the audience members understand, um, your the first uh, governing book, and maybe that uh, journal uh, article that started, um, I, I know in the first uh, governing Knowledge Commons book, you have the first chapter or second chapter that's the uh, framework that you were using to, uh, you, I remember asking the, you were asking the authors to try to follow that framework. Um, and in the Medical Commons book, I, my understanding is that, that framework is still guiding um, that volume as well to some extent, correct? Right. And, so, and, yeah, go ahead. Well, and I'm just wondering um, you know, what I really appreciate, um, and I think uh, listeners should understand, is uh, the, the, the systematic uh, approach you're going through um, with this, these case studies that are kind of guided by this overarching framework that you introduced. And so my question is, is the evolutionary aspect of the framework, um, is, has it been changing as you go from volume to volume? And are you already kind of looking, I know you're working on the privacy book now, or the privacy project. Um, so my question is the evolutionary nature of the framework you started with, with your first volume. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you for emphasizing the framework. So it, it's very important to our project that uh, we try to hold to a pretty standard research framework throughout. So the first big journal article in 2010, then the book in 2014, then the book in 2017, uh, each one of those is really grounded in uh, a standardized research framework that is modeled on uh, Ostrom's IAD framework, but that departs from it in some important respects. So just to emphasize this, pre this initial point, we are not simply applying Lynn Ostrom's work to a new set of fields. 
we're inspired by her work, we're motivated by her style of research, but we really think of, of ourselves as having developed our own research framework. Um, so that framework has evolved a bit over the over the period of years that we've been working with it and others have been working with it as well. I would say the number one way in which the the framework has evolved is uh, something I alluded to earlier in the talk, which is uh, in in the IAD framework and a lot of re commons research on natural resources the research strategy in starts, the very first set of questions has to do with the attributes of the resource. What kind of resource is this? What kind of good is this? And then uh, what are the action arenas? What are the rules in use? What are the patterns of interaction and so forth? When we started in the knowledge commons area, we initially set up our framework to follow the, a similar sequence. What kind of knowledge resource are we talking about? What are the attributes of the knowledge resource? Uh, and what we have learned by cycling through a number of case studies is that in the knowledge commons area, that sequence, starting with the resource and then understanding the governance strategy, um, may not be as effective as starting in the reverse order. That is, what we are, are now encouraging people to do and what we're doing ourselves is we say, here's a resource. Right, that's the first question, what's the resource? And then what are the dilemmas? What are the social dilemmas? What are the problems associated with producing the resource, managing the resource, distributing the resource, preserving the resource, generating access to the resource? Right, so resource one, dilemmas two, and then you get into action arenas and, and rules and use and, and other related things. But we have put what is the problem up as a very high priority question, whereas in, in Ostrom's IAD framework, the character of the dilemma uh, is not nearly such a high priority research topic, particularly early in the research scheme. So that's an example of how we've tweaked uh, in some important ways uh, our, uh, our framework and how we've applied it. That's a, that's a really interesting um, response. Um, going to think about that more, but I, I, um, it's great, Mike. Um, so there's one other question in the Q&A that says, are there challenges of studying knowledge commons that cross national boundaries? Uh, for example, IP law nationally versus international law. So I, this one sounds like it's coming a little bit more from the law perspective, given that you and your colleagues are lawyers. Um, do you see differences when these things cross boundaries um, or how do you think of the uh, the scaling I guess so uh, well that we can have a whole webinar to talk about <laughs> the, the, the the global implications uh, from a methods standpoint as well as from a, a substance of the findings standpoint um, I would say, just to, to pick off one piece of that question that I find particularly interesting, uh, all three of us as sort of the team leaders, Brett Fresh, Frischman, Kathy Strandberg, and myself, uh, we have all traveled uh, quite a bit around the US and around the world in some cases in sharing uh, the idea of the Knowledge Commons Research Framework, sharing the results, trying to encourage additional researchers uh, from the PhD level all the way up through uh, staff levels to uh, to sort of join this group, and and what what I've learned in traveling and presenting this to different audiences, and in particular presenting it in the UK, and presenting it in different European settings, is that the uh, the the notes, the themes of commons governance research that seem to stimulate the most productive feedback and the most interesting responses in a European audience are often different than the notes that seem to really uh, resonate with a U.S. audience. In the U.S., uh, the audiences for historical reasons seem to be very primed to understand commons as a as an economic institution. So U.S. audiences like to think about the, the sort of law and economics, transactions costs, motivations, incentives, uh, the sort of Garrett Hardin uh, 
uh, tragedy of the commons metaphor and its economic implications has a very, very strong hold on the US imagination, for better or for worse. Uh, in Europe, that my experience is that that's much less likely to be the case. In Europe, the themes of knowledge commons research that really seem to resonate are themes surrounding self-governance and community governance and resource management uh, as an expression of community values and community sustainability and community goals. So that the economic framework that seems to dominate the American reaction to this work uh, is not as dominant in my experience when I migrate over to European audiences. The legal framework, patent law, copyright law, and so forth, um, is, is significantly the same where you go from country to country. It's how you layer other themes on top of the law that seems to vary a little bit. Oh, that's fascinating. Mike, um, such rich uh, res and deep responses. Um, thank you so much for those great answers. Um, so I'm looking at the time. It's about time to wrap up. Uh, I'll just uh, take a look at the Q&A in case there's any other questions that come up. And uh, I'm not seeing any. So uh, I wanted to actually, as I close, um, uh, I, I, wa I want to make a connection to, because Mike, is a, I understand it, you're currently uh, at Villanova and embedded in a workshop right now on the privacy topic. That's right. So as I close and wrap up what I wanted to say just generally at this webinar and every other one we're running, um, I'm going to tie it and encourage you with the colleagues that are sitting in the building with you at the moment. Um, so I just want to say on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons and all of the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank the attendees and especially Mike for uh, preparing and giving uh, the, what, what I, it was a wonderful webinar. Um, in closing, I just want to remind listeners that um, there's two IAC upcoming events, both which are advertised on the worldcommonsweek.org website in the top left corner. Um, the first is in November, IAC is holding a first virtual conference. This is being run by Marco Johansson, um, and uh, it's, I think it's still accepting uh, participation in that. That's only about a month away. But the second is uh, the IASC's biannual uh, in-person conference in Lima, Peru in July 2019. And so, Mike, I just want to urge as you talk to your colleagues on the Knowledge Commons front in the, over in the workshop you're in now to consider possibly one or either of these options. And, uh, you know, it would be terrific if in the Peru conference, um, there's time still. The uh, the uh, paper abstracts are due November 15th, so it would be wonderful if we had uh, a strong Knowledge Commons track there, perhaps with a heavy privacy and security bent. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just tossing that out as a something to think about while you're meeting with your colleagues. But uh, I hope to see you and and other uh, attendees there next July. So with that, I'm going to just um, thank you again, Mike, for your time and efforts pulling this great talk together. Um, it will be online um, for others to see who may not have made it today. And uh, um, we, we're very grateful for your time and as, as to the attendees. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the meeting at this point.